To my left is uh, Jim Hamilton, Associate Professor of Biblical Theology at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, pastor of Kenwood Baptist Church, is that right? That's correct. So you're both, professor and pastor. Yes, sir, I'm a bivocational pastor. I don't know you do that. Um, <laughs> Dallas Seminary, THM, PhD from Southern, and uh, is teaching there. Now, I won't go into the books that these men have written, but they are all significant. Straight across from me, Doug Wilson, pastor of Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho, uh, founding board member of Logos School, trustee, senior fellow of theology at New St. Andrews College, editor of Credenda Agenda, MA in philosophy from University of Idaho, etc. And to my right, Sam Storms, a pastor of Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, President of Enjoying God Ministries, uh, THM from Dallas, PhD, University of Texas, uh, was a professor of theology at Wheaton, but has been in the pastoral ministry, what, 30 years total? About. Same as me. Well, now I'm older than you are. In fact, I'm older than all of you. But not put together. <laughs> There's a certain, certain respect that goes with age here. Okay. Maybe. Okay. We've called this an evening of eschatology. That's um, a bit broad because it, um, it bears the marks of the situation we're in. It, it really should be called an evening of millennial discussion, even though I'm sure it will go wider than that, which accounts for some of who we are here. Um, this is kind of a historical accident that we're here because of the conference that was just held and some other things. But uh, when I say millennial, I mean the issue of, and there are going to be people watching this probably who don't even know these terms, so we're going to unpack them. Premillennialism, amillennialism, postmillennialism, those are the three historic views of the so called millennium. And they're all represented at this table, uh, unless you want to qualify that title and pick another one. So that's one of the reasons that we're, we're here. Um, before we jump at definitions of, of that, I think it would be good to articulate something, and you might even want to try relating it to, to eschatology. Well, somebody give me a definition of eschatology. We probably should start there. Just jump in. When we say an evening of eschatology, um, a thumbnail definition. Study of last things. Study of last things. Anyone want to? Yes. And uh, to be distinguished from eschatology, sometimes eschatology refers to the doctrine of heaven and hell outside human history. Okay. You know, uh, past the final judgment. We're talking about the last things of human history um, leading up to the, the final judgment judgment. And then more difficult, uh, a more difficult angle is that I think all of us would agree that in a fundamental way, the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the middle of history is an eruption of the last things yep. in the middle of history, yep. 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 which has sort of thrown a spanner into everything. Yeah, I want to come back to that. You want to add to that anything, Sam? I would just say I agree with everything they've said that um, since the New Testament teaches that the last days began with the exaltation of Christ the right hand of the Father, and we have been in the last days since that time until his return, that it does refer to more than just what typically people think of, namely the last few years of activity upon the earth, uh, that it does really encompass the whole of redemptive history, but especially from uh, the time of Christ's exaltation yeah. until the time of his second coming. Yeah. Let, let's say more about that later, that, that idea of we're in the last days and how that relates to the so-called very end. So th there's the definition that we're all okay with. Eschatology, study of, talking about, thinking about last things, including where we are right now as the last days since the resurrection of Jesus. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, since Jesus. The gospel. Um, we are united here with a passion for the gospel. Let's make an attempt. You didn't know we were going to go here. Let's make an attempt for just a short time to celebrate uh, what makes us so excited to link arms in ministry here. Somebody, somebody make a stab at uh, a, a uniting statement of, of the gospel. 
The gospel is the proclamation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the sins of his people and his exaltation to the right hand of God the Father. Amen. That's the that's the good news of God's salvation uh, in Christ. God is remaking humanity, uh, restoring the image of God, uh, and Christ is that image of God that we are being restored into, and that's the good news. Yeah. And the bad news, state the bad news that that answers. Though God created us in his image and put us in a perfect world, we rebelled against him and our first father, Adam. We incurred his sin, and for that we deserve his just right and righteous wrath. That's the bad news. So everybody deserves wrath because of being sinful and being actively sinners. And uh, God is angry at us for that and will punish us forever if something doesn't solve the problem. And you said Christ died for us. Unpack just a little bit about that transaction. What, what, what happened when that happened? Died as a substitutionary sacrifice in our stead, in our place, enduring the wrath of God that we uh, deserved, absorbed it in himself, exhausted it, satisfied the holiness and the wrath of the Father. Um, at the same time, uh, his righteousness, as our guilt was imputed to him and the wrath of God fell on him for that reason, his righteousness is imputed to us that we receive by faith, so we stand declared righteous in the sight of the Father. That's the good news of what he accomplished that we receive through faith alone. So, so it's possible for a, a damnable, corrupt, sinful human being to stand before an all-holy God absolutely safe and happy in God because of what Christ did through faith alone. Amen. Amen. Everybody's okay with that? Absolutely. Yes. Christ. Christ did not die so that we might live. Christ died so that we might die. He lives so that we might live. So that we're united with him in his death. If we're united with him in his death, we're united with him in his resurrection. And that's the good news is God enables sinners to die with a prospect of resurrection. It's necessary for sinners to die. All sinners must die. There's no, that's not a negotiable. What the gospel does is enables sinners to die and come back from the dead. In Christ. If they die in Christ, they're, they're raised in Christ. If they die outside of Christ, they die outside of Christ. And perish. And perish eternally. Forever. So, this is good news. Incredibly good news. And we stand there together. Now, um, that's pretty good so far. <laughs> <laughs> It gets more difficult. <laughs> I, uh, I'm concerned about the complexity of this matter for people. And uh, so I, I want us to say something about uh, why we're doing this, why this matters, why talking about end times matters. And I know this might force you into your statement of where you are, but See if you can hold that back for me. I'm going to let you all talk about what you believe about anything. But why, why would you think that people should care about trying to come clear on eschatology, on what's going to happen? Well, I'll take a stab at that. It would be like somebody saying, um, I want to embrace the doctrine of election, but I don't want to think about whether it's conditional or unconditional or based on God's goodness or foreseen faith or how it relates to uh, the, emerge, the creation of saving faith in the human heart. I just want to affirm election. Or I, I want to affirm the incarnation of Christ, but I don't want to really think. It really doesn't help me to think that much about how the two natures relate in the one person and, and how he could live a sinless life and yet learn obedience. Um, or saying, uh, I just want to affirm the death of Jesus, but never bothering to think about how did his death save you? What actually occurred in it? What are the implications of it? So I would say the same thing. It would be like somebody saying, well, we just want to affirm the second coming of Christ, but that's all. And we don't want to learn what has led up to it and what its purpose is and how it relates to God's overall plan and redemptive history. It seems to me that uh, we should want to know all of the implications, both the the precedent, the, the preceding events, the, the, the consequences, the timing, 
uh, all of the associated realities with Christ's second coming as much as we would about his first coming, as much as we would about his incarnation, his death on the cross. So it provides us with, I think, um, uh, deeper insights into the nature of God, into how he works, uh, into uh, what his purposes are, how he's glorifying Jesus. If Ephesians 1 is correct, and it is, that all things are being uh, summed up in Christ, uh, how is that happening? What, what is the mechanism? How is God showing his manifold wisdom, the, the beauty and the majesty of his character, the complexity of his ways? And I think as we explore eschatology, we see that. So that's why I think it's important. Another reason for the importance of this discussion is um, the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 4. The Holy Spirit is building up his church, and this is an eschatological reality. The, the bride is going to be presented without spot or wrinkle or any, any, any such blemish. In Ephesians 5, in, in Ephesians 4, there is a given, real, uh, a given unity. Be careful to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace by not quarreling and, uh, and being sinful toward one another. But then he says, until we all grow up into a perfect man, until we all grow up into the unity of the faith. So there's a unity that's given, and there's a unity we must grow up into, and that unity that we're growing up into is an eschatological unity. So you can't go grow up into that in a fit of absent-mindedness. You have to talk about it and think about it and prepare for it. And the, the central thing that's going to disrupt this coming unity is sinful disruptions of the, all, the unity that's already granted. And many churches and, uh, have divided, unfortunately, over eschatological issues not realizing either the complexity of it or discovering you could create a sectarian mentality and, and consider everybody in the other camps to be bad or wrong. Two ministers were talking one time, and, and he, he, one was trying to be charitable. He said, we, you know, we both serve God, you in your way and I in his. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of thing can lead to just people getting cranked at each other. And someone once said that the, the millennium, the millennium is a thousand years of peace that Christians like to fight about. And, <laughs> and, and what we would like to do is figure out a way to grow up into that thousand years of peace so that when the, whenever it comes, however it comes, we are all sons that are worthy of it. And of course, worthy only in Christ. And we would agree too that there's a blessing in Revelation on those who read and hear and keep what is written in this book. And so to keep it, we have to understand it, to have this blessing. And I think also of, of texts like Isaiah 53 and Psalm 2 and, and those, those believing members, members of the Old Covenant remnant who read those texts and tried to put together what the outcome was going to be before Christ came. And then Jesus comes and on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, he says to these guys that didn't put it together the way that it developed and they didn't understand. He said that they were fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. And we don't want to be there. We don't want to be fools and slow of heart to believe. So these are important things to discuss. You know what you said, Doug, about there being a, a continuity or it's of a peace with the present unity and we're moving toward the fullness of unity that has a consummating point brought to my mind that prayer, in fact, it's at several points in Philippians, my, my prayer for you is that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment in order that you may approve what is excellent so that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. That, that's a prayer for right now for the day of Christ. So that, I, I, I think that's significant. Let's go back to the, uh, what you, you jumped on immediately in defining eschatology, namely that we're, we're in the last times. I think it would be helpful before we get to millennium and define that and talk about it to try to get some structural things. I don't know if we can get any unity around this or not. We'll see. Um, anybody want to talk about, I've got three texts written down here about two ages, this age, the age to come. Um, what, what is that? What are those ages? I'll read the text. Okay, here's Matthew 12, 32. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, 
But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Or Ephesians 1.21, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Would it help us just in general to get a, a, a structure of history in terms of this vocabulary of this age and the age to come? Or would that muddy the waters unnecessarily? You I, don't, want to... I don't think it'll muddy the waters, but I think it might... It, it'll probably lead to one of the first um, differences um, in First Corinthians. In First Corinthians ten, Paul is talking to um, the Corinthian church, and he's talking about the experience of the Jews in the wilderness. And he talks about how they tempted Christ, and they murmured, and they grumbled, and so forth. And then in verse eleven of chapter ten. He said, now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world, ends of the ages, are come. So Paul is identifying the, the Corinthians that he's speaking to, and, and he himself, he's living in, at, at the end of the age. All right, these, these things were written as an example for us, on whom the ends of the ages have come. Now, my basic... Um, Grid, and I'm just putting this out here now for definition's sake, is that the New Testament era was uh, an era where ages overlapped the way you have a baton exchange in a relay race. Mm -hmm. One runner is continuing to run, and the other runner starts before the other runner stops, and then there's a baton exchange. And I think that exchange you know, on the track was the 40 years between Christ's resurrection and ascension and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. So about 40 years, two ages overlap. The Judaic age, the age of types and shadows, the age of temple sacrifices was coming to an end. The author of Hebrews says, and it's about ready to disappear. It's about, uh, it's about done. But it wasn't quite done yet. And so it's coming to an end. And the new age, I had to hesitate to say I believe, mm -hmm. but the, the, good, the good new age, <laughs> had, had the, Christian, the Christian aeon began at Pentecost. So the, the Christian aeon began before the Judaic aeon ended, and the first, first century Christians were living in that wilderness period between, between these ages. They were living in that overlap. And Paul says, we are the ones on whom the ends of the ages have come. So the age, the present age and the age to come, I take as the Judaic aeon that's coming to a, a close, even in the time of the New Testament. And then the Christian aeon, the age, we're in the age to come. Mm -hmm. And then when the Lord Jesus comes again, that and the dead are raised, that's the eternal state. So, so I'm, not, I'm not taking the age to come as the eternal state. So I'm taking, would you say that, that we live in the same kind of age that Paul lived in or that there was a fundamental change in AD 70? I would say that Paul lives in the same kind of age that we live in because it was inaugurated. The difference was the old age had not yet run its course. He lives, Paul lived at the, on the threshold of the Christian aeon and we're well into it and we're not into an age that has a, a Judaic aeon also running. So Paul, Paul lived in a unique spot that we're not in, but he lived in the age that we're in. I would want to formulate things a little differently. A lot different. A lot, yeah. And, and I, I think the way, the way I would go after it is I would point to the, the uh, prophecies that the Old Testament prophets make. And I think if we, if we summarize Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 and boil down their message, their basic message is we're going into exile, but after the judgment, after exile, there's a glorious eschatological future that awaits us past this judgment. And the, they describe this glorious eschatological future not only as a return to the land of Israel, but also as a return to an Edenic state. And so it's almost as though they're dealing with two exiles, one from Eden and one from the land, and they're describing the glorious bliss as though it's all going to happen together. And then the way it seems to play out is once Jesus comes, it's as though those, those blessings of the future reach back in and take hold of the present in an already not yet kind of future, way. By future, you don't mean post-70 AD. No, I mean... You mean post-second yeah. coming. Right, exactly. 
Yes. So There's, for you, the age to come is the millennium primarily? Well, you know, it's interesting. There, there are these d disputes among the rabbis about whether what they sometimes refer to as the age of the Messiah or the, or the kingdom of the Messiah is going to be part of this age or the age to come. And I think you would want to read that to fit your view, but I would read what they refer to as the age of the Messiah as something like what I think John describes in Revelation 20, this millennium, and, and I would read John in Revelation 20 as coming down on the side of those who argued that the kingdom of the Messiah was going to, co going to come before the corruptible things were done away with, and then we enter into an incorruptible new heavens and new earth. S sketch your understanding of the two ages. Okay. I, just, I, I think it would help uh, if we just clarified what's just been said, because yeah, I, yeah. the differences are clear, and, my, and I would have a, a view different from both of them. Right. What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think what, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Doug is saying, just for the sake of clarification, that, for example, in the Ephesians passage you referenced, uh, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come, that when Paul says in this age, he's talking about the old Judaic age that is uh, gradually passing that would terminate with 70 A.D., and that the age to come, as you understand it, Doug, is the age in which we're currently living. Correct. Jim, I think, would say that in this age is the entirety of the church era between the two advents of Jesus, and the age to come is primarily the messianic reign described in Revelation 20, known as the millennial kingdom. Well, I think, I, I think what I would do is come down with those rabbis who say, no, the millennial kingdom is going to be part of this age, and then... And then the age to come is the new is heavens the, and new earth in Revelation 21 and 22. Well, then I'm closer to you than I thought. Because I would say that, that uh, and I appreciate Doug's position. I think it will probably come out a little bit more later on. And I think he's got some good arguments for it. Just not totally persuaded yet. But I would see this age also as a reference, as Jim does, to the present church age in which we live. And I would, but you would include the millennium. Yes. I would say the age to come is the new heavens and the new earth which is inaugurated at the second advent of Jesus. And you would say that we're in the millennium right now so that it's realized, right? Yes, but not, but we'll have to define in what sense. When we say we are in the millennium, I believe the millennium is simultaneous with the present age. I would not want to say that I am in the millennium, and perhaps we'll, get, and, we'll explain that just a moment. And neither are we. And, but you, you, so you're, is, I just want to make sure I heard this right, that the, you're putting the new heavens and the new earth post resurrection at the end of the yes. world. Yes. Okay. Yes. What about Isaiah? Um, in, in, uh, what do people do in the new heavens and the new earth in Isaiah? Well, one of the things they do is they die. Well, okay, if we're going to go that path, we can certainly <laughs> do that. <laughs> uh, we must go there okay. because, because um, but it might be premature to go there at this moment. Okay, so yeah, that it, is, it would be. Isaiah 65, the phrase new heavens and new earth is used, and a baby uh, grows up and I was, dies at 100. Sorry about that. I was immunitizing our eschaton yeah, here. Right. I was <laughs> right. rush, rushing yeah. things. It's all right. It's all right. Now, um, Mark 10.30, um, receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. That, that doesn't sound like post-70 AD. It, 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 it sound, and it doesn't sound like, um, I mean, it sounds like the point where we get eternal life. It's that, that how shall I inherit eternal life? It might concern this, this situation here. And, and he says, uh, you're going to get it uh, not, not in this age, but you're going to get it in the age to come. That fit what you said? Yeah, I'm in the age to come, and I have eternal life, and so do you. But is that the intention here? So, in the age I to hope come. So. so, they didn't have eternal life till 78 D. Well, no. What, um, in starting at read 29, what you just read, uh, Jesus answered and said, "Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren." Or or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake, and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. So um, think for a minute about what Jesus is actually promising. If this time is 
what age? If the age, if it's well, there's what Jesus said, but then there's what the what the what Mark intended to communicate. And Mark is writing for a Christian audience right. after the time of Jesus. Right, but Jesus said this, right, in the Jesus said this in the time of Jesus. Sure. <laughs> right. But then but then but then Mark gives it to believers who live after the resurrection. Right. Right. But the hundredfold this this seems to me, if you take it as a um, um, as a straightforward promise, you're you're this is a high octane health and wealth passage. Not for John, it didn't. <laughs> no. no, 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 no. It's not at all because a, a hundred mothers is pretty clear, right? Right. That is, it's not literal. Hundred mothers and hundred sisters. That means that means I've got lots of friends who have lots of families, and I can, I won't be destitute. When but he I'm, but he's talking in, in very earthy terms: right. family, children, right. and and lands. Right. right. It's a very um, and he's talking to disciples who have given those things up. Right, and have lots of people around them and, who... And we would interpret this the way that uh, Paul speaks to the Corinthians, you know, everything is yours. Right. The, 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 everything belongs to you. Now, I, I agree with that, but I would include that everything that belongs to you includes the land, the, the earth. Uh, all things are yours in Christ. So it's not just spiritual blessings. It is spiritual blessing preeminent, uh, you know, the, the spiritual reality is, is the governing thing, but it, it, does, it comes down to the level of family and relationship and land. So how, how is, we won't, we won't press on this forever, uh, it's just when I'm trying to understand your view about how this age is up till 70 AD, o overlapping from resurrection to 70 AD, and then, and then the age to come begins there. My whole conception is that the age to come uh, begins at the second coming. And maybe, maybe this will help. When Jesus says in, at the end of Matthew that, behold, I'm with you to the end of the age, I don't believe that that means that Jesus will be with the disciples up to 70 AD and then at see you. <laughs> um, so Jesus, when he says, I'll be with you to the end of the age, we're not to infer from that that his promise is then null and void for the age to come. He's simply saying, I'm going to be with you up to the end of the age and of course, I'll be with you in the age to come. I think what he's saying here is, I'm going to bless you if you give, if you surrender uh, all things for my sake. I'm going to, I'm going to bless you. I'll keep you. I'll be with you. Bless you in just the way it's describing here, uh, family and lands and every, all of that. And I will be with you. He's not saying that in this age you don't have eternal life, and the next one you will. And he's not saying in the age to come where you have eternal life you won't have spiritual family or blessings or you know. It, both things are true of both ages. I, it's important, I think, just again for the sake of clarity, because I suspect that some who eventually watch this may not have been, have never been exposed to what Doug is saying, that the age which the disciples anticipated would come to an end that is being referred to here is in what he is suggesting the Jewish age, not the end of human history. Correct. We tend to think, most evangelicals think, end of the age means it's all over. End of history. Time ends. We either go millennium or eternal state. Right. Doug is saying something altogether different. He right. is saying that it's the end of the Jewish age that came about in 70 AD because of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and God's judgment against um, the nation. Okay. And, I, and I see that as the inauguration of the new heavens and the new earth. It's a new creation. Uh, all things have been made new. And I don't see how, that, and my central argument for that would be the fact that we worship on Sunday. Nothing, if you look at what God says about the Sabbath and the everlasting nature of the Sabbath in the Old Testament, nothing would suffice to alter the Sabbath commemoration of the first creation short of a new creation. The reason we worship on the Lord's Day is because there's been a new creation. All things have been made new. Now, that doesn't mean the, the kingdom of God, the new age, all of this stuff that arrives doesn't arrive like the 82nd Airborne. It, it arrives like um, yeast that, that works through the loaf. It's a, it's a gradual accumulation thing throughout history. So you wouldn't be able to pop up in 80 AD and take a photograph of it and say, see, you know, see. Well, it's, it's a 
it's a tiny rock that's been carved out in Daniel. It's a tiny rock that starts small. It's a mustard seed sized thing then. You can't see it. You're not going to be able to see it really clearly until 3,000 years from now. Do you want to talk about the millennium? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, One more pre-millennium question. Um, Do you all believe that the Lord Jesus is is coming back uh, physically, visibly, to reign some way or other on the earth forever. Yes. 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 Okay. Well then. <laughs> I guess that settles it. Um, what is the final, final, final condition of the universe where we will spend eternity? Just describe it in a, in a nutshell. New heavens and new earth, incorruptible. Uh, and I think that the description in Revelation 21 and 22 matches and exceeds point for point what we find in Genesis 1 and 2, the description of the Garden of Eden. It's a new and better Eden where uh, God and the Lamb are the temple. They will see his face. There will be no need of sun or moon. There will be no sea, no evil. And it will be a, a perfectly clean and holy of holy place. This earth? It, this earth included. So there's going to be a, a, a reunification of heaven and earth but this earth is not rejected. And I think the clearest uh, place that's taught is in Romans 8, where the, the whole creation groans, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Um, and we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. And the, the, there are three groans in that passage. The, um, the creation groans, uh, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan, and the Spirit helps, helps us in our weakness with groans that that are too deep for words. And all of that groaning is, is teleological. It's focused toward the same end, which is the revelation of our adoption as sons, which is the redemption of the body, the resurrection of, of the dead. So the, this created order, this old earth, is longing for the day when the Christ, Christians are manifested for who they are because our salvation will be this earth salvation. And it will be swept up into this, as you were saying this morning, it's going to be, uh, God's going to blow the top of it. So we can't connect. So there's a, not a um, annihilation of the present order and a new one, but rather what? What, what would you call it? Uh, resurrected, resurrected, death and, bar- death and resurrection pattern for the created order, just as for us. Yeah, there's a continuity and discontinuity in terms of what will happen with us in our resurrection bodies. Uh, we will be raised in these bodies, but they'll be gloriously changed, eradicated, sin eradicated, evil eradicated, uh, with new properties, new capacities that we can't even begin to grasp. We see a little bit of it in Jesus in his post-resurrection state upon the earth. And there will be continuity, but also great discontinuity in moving from this earth to the new earth. Mm -hmm. But I would agree with exactly how Jim had had described it just a moment ago. And I'd also say, I'm glad you read the Romans 8 passage, because that's one of the reasons why I'm on millennial. So you tip your hand. I'm sorry for stumbling you. <laughs> so we're, we're all moving toward, uh, in your book, Heaven Misplaced, is yes. what it's called? Uh-huh. You have a phrase that I thought was provocative, which is not unusual. <laughs> this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through, and you changed it to, you remember? No, I don't. He- heaven is... Not my home. Oh, yes. I'm just a yeah. passing through. Right. Explain that. Um, or I will if you can't remember. Yeah. yeah I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember, often don't remember uh, what uh, I write. Uh, 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 <laughs> I, I remember it now. <laughs> <laughs> but this is important because yeah. a lot of us here, uh, I think, in, in America and evangelicalism, uh, think I'm going to heaven. Right. Period. It's, I'm, I'm in heaven, that's it. Right. And now I'm there. And and what they, let's, let's clarify that. And what they think about when they think heaven, they get most of the theology of heaven from far side cartoons and pearly gates jokes. And someone dies, goes to be with the Lord. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So here we are. You believe that? Uh, absolutely. Okay, yeah, good, Paul good, said good, it. Good. <laughs> and it doesn't mean something weird. I mean, it just no, says no. what he said. Right? <laughs> 
Paul often means something weird. <laughs> yes. Okay. But, it, it but is, not there. All right. All right. So, to, uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That means in 2009, if I die, then I'm with the Lord instantly. All right? But let's say the second coming, for the sake of discussion, is a thousand years out still. So, what's the condition of the departed saint between this date and the day of resurrection? Well, that's the intermediate state, mm -hmm. for want of a better phrase, the intermediate state of glory right. where you're with the Lord. And many Christians have gone that far, which is good. The Bible, I think the Bible teaches it. Philippians 1, yeah, it, absolutely. it is better. It's better, better to than here, depart right? and to be with Christ. So it's if, better. If, if I have yes. a church member who dies this year, I can say to them, this is going to be so much better, better. now. Absolutely. Okay, right. right. So keep going. Because you're right. in the millennial reign of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Save that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now he's emanatizing the eschaton. Yes, right. if, so in that intermediate state, many Christians have accepted that intermediate state as our final hope. Yes. But in the creed, we confess that we believe in the resurrection of the dead, right. not in the immortality of the soul. Yeah. Now we do believe yeah. in the immortality of the soul, gotcha. but, but that's not our final hope. Right. Our final hope yeah. is the dead are raised. Mm -hmm. And... So this intermediate state of heaven, many Christians have said, that's my final hope, and they think that they're going to die and go off into a 17th dimension floaty place. Mm -hmm. And this floaty place is something they can't even relate, begin to relate to, and so they don't think about it at all. They sort of put it out of their minds because they can't get them, I'm, am I going to be a human being? What am I, you know, good grief. And so they don't long for the day of resurrection. But what you were citing this morning, when we see him, we're going to become like him uh, because we're going to see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure. So when we hope for the day of resurrection, that has a that's a sanctifying influence. And if we get stuck halfway in the intermediate state, we're, we're not setting our final hope where we, where we ought to. So when I said, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through, and I flipped it around, Heaven is not my home. I'm just passing through. I was referring to that intermediate state. Right. We're just passing through the exactly. intermediate state. And when, we're, when, when we die and go to be with the Lord, it's better than here in that intermediate state yes. because you're with Christ. That's right. But you still have something to look forward to. Yeah, massive to look forward to. Resurrection of the body and all of its capacities to delight in Christ. Right. So we're still together, right? Yes. Okay. So die, go to be with Christ. Uh, Whatever the time frame is, we wind up on a planet, renovated, is that word okay? Yeah. And um, kind radically, of small, but radically renovated. Radically renovated. No sea, you said. That's going to disappoint a lot of people. Does that bother you? No, I think. It bothers the, me. Well, the sea, the sea, I think, is a symbol of evil and a place from which oh, the beast arises. So we can have arises. a sea, but. Who knows? That's good to hear him say yes. that it's a symbol. Huh? Yeah. It's, it's we'll talk you can't about let it go. Sam. I'm, I'm eager, Sam, you to talk all about symbols. But, yeah. You came prepared to do one thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one thing I do. Harp on amillennialism. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, at any rate, no sea means something. Mm -hmm. and like, I think it means the ocean becomes a lake. Lakes are okay. <laughs> right? I, I really believe that. Seas are dangerous. They have, they have leviathans in them, mm -hmm. and they have depths that are really scary, mm -hmm. and, and you sink, and you, you're, it's just horrible. But lakes, co people go to lakes in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, I, I Certain don't, things need to be mortified, man. Uh, <laughs> not the love of lakes. Greatness. <laughs> but anyway, so it's going to be different. It's going to be good. It, we can tell our children. I remember nine years old, lying on top of my house, looking at the stars and not wanting heaven to come. I was scared of heaven because it seemed so ethereal. So right. what was that phrase you were using? So yeah. Floaty. Flo floaty. I, and I remember as a, boy, as a boy growing up in a conservative evangelical situation, I remember distinctly not wanting to go to heaven. Yes. I did not want to go to heaven because you couldn't play football there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Right? You now, couldn't do, you, you didn't have a body. The I, best answer to that is not that there'll be football there. Right. However, that Christ will be there, we need to grow into that. Right. But probably football. Right. You hear that? Yeah. The, so the issue, Maybe golf. <laughs> Maybe. Remote possibility. <laughs> Assuredly baseball. That's right. Right, Jim. That's right. That's right. 
So they get the idea. We, we get the idea that, that we're all aiming toward new earth, new heavens, radically, gloriously, 10,000 times better, no sun needed, the moon is replaced by the lamb who is the lamp, and, and uh, just stunningly attractive, and we'll all want to be there. And, and, and all the capacities, t test this one, because I really want us to agree on, on these massive things. All the capacities for senses have not been created to be thrown away. Right. Taste, sight, touch, smell, hearing, music, right. art, all the things that seem to enrich the life that isn't just scraping out a living will be maximized there and, and Christ will radiate off from right. it. And, and what the, the point about football and golf and those things, the underlying, the subtext there is we will have bodies. Yes. We will be human beings. We're not going to be ghosts. Yep. And many Christians have become Gnostics. You know, if you tell them that Jesus rose from the dead spiritually, they'll fight you tooth and nail because that's liberalism. But when you ask them, what will, you, what will your body be like? They often say, Bo you know, body. And I, I can't tell you how many times when I've emphasized Jesus in his resurrection appearance, he goes into the kitchen and he rummages in the fridge for some fish, fish and honey and he, he, and he, and he um, uh, sets up a little barbecue on the beach in John and cooks some fish there. Everybody, Christians know that Jesus had a body, but Philippians says that our lowly bodies are going to be transformed to be like his body. And many Christians don't think that they will have bodies. And that's the, the point of this. However glorious it is, it's going to be further up and further in. It's going to be, it, I think this is one of the best things about Lewis, it's going to be more solid, more material, more glorious, more weighty, not, um, not a ghostly um, ethereal existence. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, on the way there, uh, what do we encounter? So now I want you guys to just take whatever amount of time you want within you know, limits to sketch your position. Premillennial, if you want to be called that. Postmillennial, if you want to be called that. Amillennial, if you want to be called that. So start and let the let the watchers of this thing know what that is and, and whatever else you want to say about it, why you like it, why you believe it, but it can't be forever, okay? So just relatively, and whatever, why don't we go so like I this? I think the, 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 the key question here and, and the question that settles this discussion is does or does not John intend to teach that there is going to be this thousand year period between a first resurrection and a second resurrection. Yeah. So let, let, can I just suggest this? Sure. Sketch your position, all of you, and then let's go there. Mm -hmm. Okay? In, in detail. Read it. Okay. Read it. Is that okay? You want me to read this passage no, now? No. I, no. I want to do that after we get the sketch. After we sketch the position. Is that all right? Sure. Sure. I mean, so if, my, if you don't like that, just tell me I don't so like that yeah. and do it another way. Well, my position is that Revelation does communicate symbols, but we should interpret the symbols in relationship to one another, and that if we do that, there, it is clear that there's going to be a resurrection of believers and then they will reign with Christ for a thousand years and then there'll be another resurrection, a so great white back, throne back judgment. Up. Christ, the next thing on the agenda is Christ comes. Christ that, comes, that's okay. right. That's where the All resurrection All the believers happens. rise. Right. The unbelievers do not rise in this first resurrection. Okay. And then the believers all reign with Christ for a thousand years. Right. Literally and on the earth. Literally on the earth. Jesus and is here Jesus in his resurrection here. body. Yes, okay. and, and premillennialists often say that uh, there are unbelievers who survive his first coming and enter into the millennium and that they then uh, have offspring and that not necessarily everyone is regenerated right. in that period. Yeah. And, and if this seems fantastic mm -hmm. and uh, difficult to believe, um, again, I, I just want to, to point to this being a plausible idea for contemporaries of the authors of these texts. And um, so anyway, after this period, after this thousand year reign, mm -hmm. uh, there will be an, uh, a releasing of Satan. He's been bound for this thousand years. Mm -hmm. There'll be a final rebellion. It will be put down, and then the great white throne judgment will be set up. So I, I would read Revelation and then, 20 and then comes the renovation. And then comes the new heavens and the new earth. That's correct. Okay. I think that's pretty clear. Mm 
So you, you assumed, you, you mentioned it in retrospect, that when he comes, when Christ comes in the resurrection, there's a binding and a pit thing yes. there going on. Yes, that's we'll, right. We'll get to that, we'll read that passage. Okay, so Christ comes, Christians are raised, unbelievers are not. The millennium, which refers to a, a thousand years. The, give it says take, he's going to reign for a thousand years. Okay, a thousand years um, of reigning. A final judgment, new heavens, new earth. Your take. Right. It's, I'm happy to be called a post-millennialist, although uh, I think it is unfortunate that all the major positions are named after a word that occurs in one chapter, I think one of the most difficult chapters in one of the most difficult books of the Bible, and then all the positions take their, uh, their orientation from what, where do you think Christ's coming is going to be with relationship to that millennium. So. On Revelation 20, there are a number of things that I haven't sorted out yet, but I've sorted out enough to know that I believe myself to be a post, what is commonly called a post-millennialist. And that is uh, just something on the book of Revelation. Ambrose Bierce in his uh, book, The Devil's Dictionary, said, uh, defined apocalypse as a book in which St. John the Divine concealed all that he knew. Um, the revealing is done by the commentators who know nothing. You know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so with that as a warning to myself, um, he, my understanding of the, the map of uh, redemptive history is that God created man in an, the Edenic state. We rebelled and fell. God promised a Messiah <coughs> through types and shadows and sacrifices, prepared the way, tilled the soil, preparing the way for the, the restoration of Eden. When Christ came in the fullness of time, he was born of a woman, born under the law. He was crucified for the sins of all his people, <coughs> buried, raised from the dead, and ascended into heaven, gave his Holy Spirit. At, in 70 AD, that age of preparation came to a climactic, climactic convulsive conclusion. And shortly, Tell the people why. Not everybody here knows what happened in 70 oh, AD. Oh, in 70 AD, um, the temple was destroyed by the Roman army. Um, there was a revolt of the Jews against uh, Rome. Uh, it lasted for, uh, the, the revolt lasted, interestingly, for 42 months. Uh, excuse me, uh, Nero's persecution of the church lasted for 42 months, which is uh, named in uh, the book of Revelation as the, the period of time that the beast would be attacking the uh, the saints. So I believe that this climatic, uh, this convulsive conclusion to the age of preparation came in 70 a AD. Up to that time, it was possible for Christians to go to the temple and worship as Paul, as Paul did. Paul would go there and, and preach. He took a Nazarite vow and, you know, he was still functioning in the structure of the temple because it was, as the author of Hebrews said, it didn't end in 33 AD. It, it's fading away. It's, it's about to be done. The, at Pentecost, the new age was established. The Christian aeon was established. And I, I believe that post-millennialism in brief is this. It's the, it's the idea that the gospel is going to grow and flourish and, and um, take over the whole earth. Basically, the Great Commission will be successful. Prior to all the nations discipled, baptized, taught obedience... The, the, the Great Commission will be successful on earth, in history. The world will be Christianized. Then Jesus will come. All enemies will be subdued, brought under his feet. In Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Which, that happened in the ascension. Jesus went, ascended into heaven, and God told him, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. So Christ's enemies are made a footstool progressively throughout all history. And then he will come and judge the last enemy personally, death. So at the conclusion of the Christian aeon, which I, the millennium I take as a symbol of this Christian aeon, the, this age of grace, the age in which the Great Commission is being fulfilled. At the end of this, Christ will come again and destroy the last enemy, death. The dead will be raised and we are ushered into the eternal state. So I believe that Judaic aeon, new creation, new heavens and earth, the age to come now. Satan is bound now? Yes, with regard to deceiving the nations. And Revelation was written before AD 70? Yes, I'm, yes I'm, thank you. Um, I believe the book of Revelation 
was and written, all the other books that it and I believe all the whole in New Testament I believe was written prior to 70 AD. Um, so I believe that John is prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, the, the great harlot I take is the city of Jerusalem. So when Paul tells the Thessalonians that they were destined to suffer, and when Peter says to the Christians that he writes to that that uh, they were called for this, right. to follow in Jesus' footsteps suffering. That applies to those Christians before 70 AD or to us now too? It, it certainly applies to them. That was the context in which that was being written. But um, the same thing applies to us as well. The, the, Even the, though we're going to take over the earth? Well, certainly. It's especially because we're going to take over. So the, the point is, um, when, you, uh, when the gospel goes forth, it's going forth into a, a hostile world. So we're declaring that Christ is Lord, Christ is King. They don't want him to be King. They want to deny that. So you're going to see the same thing played out over and over again. But so, you're saying that the gospel is going to take over right. and that we're going to dominate the world by, at by, which point the suffering would end. Well, or if, I mean, yes, you said a minute correct. ago, we're in the millennium, right? Right. So suffering has ended for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to break it to you. <laughs> not, not at this very moment. Not, not at the, well, this... <laughs> You're, you're, you count it all joy. I, I count it all. Do. I'm doing okay. Uh, here's, so here's the, um, if you take the millennium as, a, 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 there's a difference between some of the 19th century post-millennialists and uh, some of the contemporary ones of whether the thousand years is literal. Some say that the Great, the great Commission is fulfilled progressively, finally gets to a certain uh, tipping point and then there's a little literal thousand year golden age bef before the end. Uh, others, uh, more contemporary post-millennialists post generally take it as the entire church age, but there's a... Uh, so can you explain to me how the suffering dynamic works? The suffering dynamic is the way the golden age is ushered in is constant in all ages. And it's the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. We, we don't... So you never really realize the millennium where the gospel has taken over and suffering ends. Uh, no, because Christ is, for example, Christ is not suffering now, but he has suffered. So you can enjoy the fruit of, you can... But I'm asking about the suffering that we do as we follow in the footsteps of Christ. Right. As we, as we suffer, as we sacrifice, as we send missionaries out to preach the gospel, as people um, give their lives away, not wasting their lives, as they, do, as they do this sort of thing, God honors it. God blesses it. And when God blesses it, subsequent generations enjoy the fruit of, of that. And at some point in history, you have to enter into that possession. But I'm pressing this question because I think the New Testament is clear that Christians are going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and conquer the way he conquered by being faithful unto death, not loving their lives even unto death, until he comes. And then there will be this... this millennium, but that's clear from what I said a minute ago. Yep. And I don't see how that fits in the post-millennial But see, we would all have the same problem, right? In the, in the millennium, you still have followers of Jesus. You still have regenerate people who aren't, aren't but it, being persecuted. But at that point, the all, everyone who's beheaded on behalf of Jesus gets raised and Christ now reigns the way that you right. say he reigns now. Right. And there's no more persecution of Christians because Satan is bound. Right. According to, I mean, according to the way that I would read Revelation 20. So it, it, to, as a quick answer to this, I would say that if you take martyrdom and suffering as a bare minimum that you can't be a disciple unless, that's, unless it's happening to you, that leaves a lot of North American Christians up a creek. Right. Well, right. they may not be assaulting us physically, but they're, but they're coming at us and, and telling us basically that our heads are in the sand or they're in various ways, right. telling us to be quiet at right. the Thanksgiving Except for dinner. Except the way the, the, the recipients of Peter's first letter did. Right, they right, verbal, been, right, right, not slander, necessarily physical. Ostracism, that's right. marginalized. That's yeah. right. And I, it seems to me that your position would demand that all that's over if we're in the millennium and Satan is bound. Well, no. uh, let, me, let me ask it this way. Uh, just sketch out a little more the golden age because th that's never been clear to me from Edwards. I mean, right, right. You sh people should know that y you're... you're you're on the side of my favorite theologian. I know. Okay? I was so going to bring that this up. This is a problem to me. There's two main arguments for post-millennialism. One, it's a lot of fun. And number two... Jonathan Edwards and, believed and, and it. And Jonathan Edwards believed it, and I'm tempted to rest my case. Believed it. <laughs> believed it.
believed it past tense. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't believe it anymore. He, 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 not anymore. That's right. That's right. That's right. Not anymore. And I, and I think John is a greater authority than Jonathan yeah. Edwards. And I want to argue eventually, although I'm the moderator and I'm supposed to be careful, um, that the very fun, I don't like the word, but I know what you mean, yeah. that you have can be had by all three of these views, big mm -hmm. time. Right. We, we, I, mean, yes, I, I read you and I think, hmm, hmm, practically, how is this working out? We'll, we'll, we'll go there. So you, I, I, I don't get Edwards, you get Edwards, but, but I, I do get fun. I get the fun. Yeah, you can have fun. So, but, no, but I want him to sketch it out. How long does the golden age have to last? Like five years? Well, uh, a year, uh, and, and how do you know when you're there, and what, is it 70% are Christian, or 80, or, you got any of that in your head? Actually, that, that's a, uh, that is a lot, of, that's an easy one, because the answer to all of that is, man, we don't know. We don't know. We, how, how could we know that? It does not yet appear, okay. if the final end result, okay. it does not yet appear uh, what we're going to be like. Could it be right before. now? Could it be right now? We're in it? Well, yeah, I suspect cool. not. Oh. <laughs> 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 Did they enter into it when they had the shining city on the hill here when they first came over? And, and they had this society that was dominated by believers? Yeah, that's one of the problems is that Christians frequently, because uh, um, I should say that from the Reformation, very early on, within the first few generations in the Reformation, down through Jonathan Edwards and, and men like Warfield, the, uh, po the post-millennial view has been very, very common in reformed um, circles. It was the received um, view for, for a long period of time. And one of the temptations of post-millennialists, and this goes off of your talk this morning uh, about the new heavens and the new earth and, and confusing the gift with the giver, and your talk last night, there's a, there's a tempta the temptation that post-millennialists face is that of getting cozy, settling down, and calling what God has, the blessings that God really is giving to them, the, this is the final deal. But eyes not seen or ear heard what God's prepared for, for those who love him. And so we, what we do is we rush it. And so we, the shining city on a hill. Can, yeah, well, yeah. well, go ahead. The shining city on a hill, you have a continent before you, you've got able Bible teachers, you've got reformed life and worship, what else could there be? Jesus has to be coming you know, soon. This is the golden age. We've got a great opportunity. And one of the things that we should learn from, a sage once said, the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Uh, we really need to be humble about what's it going to look like in the year 3,500. I don't have any idea of what it's going to look like. I know that taking it in 500-year chunks, I believe that it's going to be a whole lot better for the gospel and for the nations and for the people of God then than now, just as we are in a much, um, our, our sufferings are nothing compared to what happened in the persecutions under Diocletian. Right, but there are right. people in Iran maybe, or in Turkey, who maybe have it as bad or worse. Uh, uh, absolutely, yeah. The, the, the 20th century was the century of martyrdom. There were more martyrs in that century. But in, in our stream, we have it better than they did, because of what they did, we've inherited that blessing. Now, what I'm saying is that process can occur in all nations at all, at all time, and, and subsequent generations can receive yeah, the yeah. benefit of the yeah. faithfulness of previous generations. So, you have a huge ambiguity in discerning what the condition at the end will be, and, and I do too. Mine is, I'm, I'm not sure what the reaching of all the nations will B, Matthew 24. I prefer to call it principled ambiguity. Okay, instead of huge. <laughs> huge, yeah. yeah. <laughs> ambiguity on purpose. Uh, okay, but it, it, does, it does leave open some remarkable possibilities, like he could come very soon. Not like a thousand yes. years from now. I, yeah. And the, the global south events and the massive spread of Christianity in Latin America and Asia and Africa, as thin as it may be, the books that are being written about it, the new Christendom and so on, are perhaps enough Correct. that he could come soon. Right. I said earlier, I suspect not, but it's certainly possible. And I, I think it'd be dangerous and arrogant to prescribe for God what he can and can't yeah. do. Yeah. And this could, if, it, if this is, um, 
his time, I suspect we're still in the period of the early church. But if that's wrong, um, I would, uh, I was talking to Sam earlier, I heard, I only met um, Rush Dooney, the reconstructionist guy, one, one time I saw him at a conference, and he said something on this uh, with regard to the premillennial option, which I would amen heartily, and that is, he, he said, I'm not opposed to changing my theology in midair. <laughs> no, that, so we're all going to be in midair. We're all going. I think we're going to be agreed about that. Yeah. Right. Just where do we go once we meet him in the midair? There's right. another view. Yeah. There yes. Is, yeah. I know. Of course, Sam. <laughs> you tried to jump the gun, and now you're having to wait. All right. I've always so wanted to do penance. In, in 30, seconds, thirty seconds, distinguish. Give me the outline that con, that di- the basic differs. distinction is that the premillennial, all the positions are named with reference to where you place the second coming of Christ okay. with regard to the millennium. So the premillennial view is the millennium is a thousand years of peace on earth and Christ comes prior to the millennium, so hence premillennial. Right. Postmillennial says that the millennium is an earth, has an earthly manifestation and we can see the progress of the gospel in time and history on earth and Christ's coming is after the millennium, post, postmillennial. So that's the, that's the basic distinction between pre and post. Wow. There are so many things that, both, that they've both said that I agree with and mm-hmm. many things that I disagree with. Um, first you, of all, you're representing a view that I don't like the label. Um, but a millennial because it suggests that I don't believe in a millennium. I believe the millennium is literal, real, vibrant, tangible, but it's in heaven. And I think that what, Rev, what Doug described as the intermediate state, where your father is right now, where my father is right now, where Jonathan Edwards is right now, where Augustine is right now, those are the saints described in Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6, who are reigning with Christ in the intermediate state, spanning the duration of the present church age between the two comings of Jesus. That constitutes the millennial reign. So I don't embrace the, millennial, the amillennial view, which um, I hear so often expressed, that it's the reign of Christ over the hearts of his people in the church right now. I don't believe that. I think the millennial reign is the reign of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. He's talking about those in the intermediate state between the two comings of Christ. So do believe very much in a millennium. In fact, it's interesting. There was no such label as amillennialism really until about the early 20th century. All amillennialists were called postmillennialists. I'm postmillennial in the way that Doug is in the sense that I believe that the return of Christ comes post or after the millennium. His millennium is on the earth. It's the progressive triumph of the church through the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe the millennium is in heaven it constitutes the reign of Christ with his saints in the intermediate state. So I would agree with Jim that the problem that I have with Doug's view is that when I read 2 Corinthians 4 and 6 and Romans 8 and elsewhere, I believe that the, the people of God on the earth will continue to suffer, uh, that that's a global phenomenon that may be more intense on one side of the earth than the other. We don't suffer here. We, can't even, we shouldn't even allow, be allowed to say that when we think of... Uh, our brothers and sisters in China or in Iran or in Indonesia and other places. But suffering will continue. Good and evil will follow parallel paths. There will be the expansion of the uh, kingdom of Satan and the intensification of his persecution of the church at the same time that there is an expansion of the gospel and uh, the, the progressive triumph of Jesus and that these will be terminated, consummated in the second coming of Christ, at which time there will be the final judgment, the final resurrection, the inauguration of the eternal state, the new heavens and the new earth. Um, I, as you mentioned in the introduction, both Jim and I graduated from Dallas Seminary. So there was a time when um, I embraced very enthusiastically the view that he articulated. And Did, just, but you held the whole dispensational view, right? When I was in, when I was in Dallas, it was... A couple of years after I got out through George Ladd's influence that I uh, abandoned dispensationalism and then about 1984 became an amillennialist. So you went from dispensationalist to historic pre-mill to amillennial. And the reason I did, very simply, if I can... He's a, he's a pilgrim. Yep. That's right. I'm a sojourner. And you think he's almost there, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Just, just, well, 
keep going. <laughs> and and the, uh, the reason why I moved from premillennialism to amillennialism, and I'll state this probably in five minutes, I kept reading the New Testament, which seemed consistently over and over again to teach that physical death terminates with the second coming of Christ. When is, when is the death of death? When does death die? When is it swallowed up in victory? I would agree with Doug on this point. At the second coming of Jesus, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58, it is when the, the Lord returns and we are changed corruptible to incorruptible that death, citing the passage from Isaiah, death is swallowed up in victory. I also kept reading the New Testament. It seemed to me, and here's where I differ with Doug, that at the second coming of Christ is the inauguration of the new heavens and the new earth not a thousand years later. I also, in reading the New Testament, referring to Romans 8, came to understand that the curse is lifted from this present earth, that the, the natural order is redeemed and enters into the fullness of, of its uh, regeneration simultaneously with that which occurs to the children of God. They are, they are correlated, as, as Doug said, and so that the curse is completely lifted from the natural order at the same time it is lifted from us, and therefore I don't see how you can have a thousand years after that in which unbelievers and eventually even Satan himself wreak havoc upon this earth because that would say the curse perpetuates beyond the second advent. So you're saying that all these other texts in the New Testament control and determine your reading of Revelation 20? Largely. Yeah. Not, so, no, no, let me finish. Not, not entirely, but largely. You're right. I'm sitting here at one time. But let me just make it clear because we'll come to this. I'm not an amillennialist in spite of Revelation 20. I'm an amillennialist precisely because of it. Okay. I think it is enthusiastically clear on amillennialism. <laughs> well, but let me, let I me, can't no, wait let me, to talk about that passage. Okay, yeah, <laughs> let me finish my point. I also believe as I read the New Testament that the second coming of Christ terminates all possibility of getting saved. It's this age in which salvation is possible. But as Jim said, there are going to be countless, who knows, thousands, if not millions, coming to faith in Christ after the second coming. I don't see that in the New Testament. Furthermore, it seems to me, I, and I agree with Doug on this, that at the second coming of Christ is the final resurrection for both the good and the evil. At the second coming of Christ is the final judgment for both good and evil. Um, and so... I kept seeing the New Testament say that at the second coming of Jesus, all these things terminate, consummate, conclude, which would preclude the thousand-year reign that I formerly believed, which says physical death continues, resurrections continue, judgments are continuing and are separated and maybe even occur multiple times throughout the whole thousand years. People keep coming to faith in Christ. The text that I read in the New Testament simply would not allow that to happen. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay, at the end of the Gospels, how does Judas die? How does he, how does he perish? At the, how does his physical body die at the end of the Gospels? Is this a trick question? No, it's not. I just want you to tell me the answer. <laughs> Sounds tricky to me. Yeah. <laughs> but I... I want to know. Well, you know, you know like in, when Acts where he fell... No, no, no. His... I'm asking about the Gospels. In the Gospels, he hung himself, right? Mm -hmm. Does that preclude what Acts tells us about how he dies? Because that's the way you're arguing. No, it's not. He yes, was it is. dead when he hung himself. He died. He didn't die again in Acts. But all Acts tells us is that he fell headlong and his insides bust out. Right. So, and so he hangs himself. But the way you're arguing, then... you're harmonizing. Yeah. You're harmonizing. Well, sure why can't we harmonize what Revelation 20 says with what all these other texts say about when because death these ends texts don't and when the resurrection these texts happens? These don't allow it. That's, if that's death dies no. at the second coming well, then, of Christ. Then why can't we say the Gospels don't allow the fact that he fell headlong and his insides burst But out? he only died once. He only died once. He didn't die at the end of the Gospels but and Acts then die again But doesn't say anything about him hanging himself. So do you believe he died twice? No. 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 I'm that's saying we're harmonizing the two passages... We're harmonizing the death of Judas from what, what the Gospels tell us and what Acts tells us. And I'm saying that we, we can do the same thing. See, you, it seems to me that your main argument against premillennialism is the rest of the New Testament precludes that interpretation. Absolutely. And I'm arguing that, that is, that's your problem, not the Bible's problem. The, All I know the Bible is, gives us this information. All I know is, it's is, our is responsibility that Paul says to put in it 1 together. Corinthians 15, 50 and following, we shall not all sleep, we shall be changed in a so, moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. 
the last trumpet, the so trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised in perishable. It's our responsibility. It's not the Bible's problem. Yeah, but there's, With, har there's the harmonization. The Bible is but, not but, precluding but Jim, this interpretation. But wait a minute. Let me, let me point out. Earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says very clearly okay. that. Well, let me wait ask second, you this. Wait a second. That, that talking about the resurrection, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now, now let me just finish. And then in that same chapter, he then tells us when death dies, when that last enemy is put to rest. And incites the, the prophecy from Isaiah, death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? It happens at the second coming. But your so view my point is how then that can is an millions of people continue to die physically after the second coming? Your view demands that what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 is exhaustive. In other words, that about the, nothing about the else termination to know. of physical well, death, it, absolutely. Well, it's, it's exhaustive. Yes. It's exhaustive on enemies. The, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And, and I think that I want to respond to you the same way that that I suspect maybe Simeon, you know, when he talks about the sword that's going to pierce Mary's soul, might have responded to some triumphant messianic conquering king, person, interpreter, you know. Simeon, I think, would probably say, don't you think it's possible that the Messiah might have to suffer? And, and, and I think that conquering Messiah person would say, no, Psalm 2 and Isaiah 9 and all these other texts preclude that interpretation, just like you're saying. And, no, and I, I think, it's think it's possible that God thing. can weave these things together. So the question is, but what have, does Revelation 20 teach? But Jim, you'd have to, you'd have to come up with, uh, with the Simeon thing. You, the, pers the discussion would say, all right, you've got these triumphant Messiah, and then you've got the suffering servant. You've got a, a bunch of texts that would, re that would require the harmonization. Yeah. There, in, in the situation here, what you would need is texts that talk about enemies to be subdued after the last enemy is subdued. And I, that's, I, that's the difficulty. So there's harmonization and there's, so on the Acts case, I think all of us who've gone through the synoptics know what harmonization looks like, but there's sometimes, I, have, I think we've all seen uh, well-meaning Christians harmonizing away and there was too much there to harmonize. I, again, I say, the question is, what does Revelation 20 teach? And if it teaches that there's, that there's a millennium, it's our responsibility to put it together with, with the rest of the Bible. Not to say Revelation 20 can't be teaching that. And, and then say, to look for another way to read it. And I would say it. if Revelation 20 teaches uh, a premillennial view as you articulate it, I have to abandon biblical inerrancy. No, no, no. No, you don't say yeah. that. No, there's no, no. Yes, I do. Wait, well. Good grief, Sam. <laughs> don't yes, say I that. Do. Well, <laughs> No, yes, I do, because it would teach me something explicitly no. contrary to what Paul is teaching no, me no. in Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 15. You just need to go reread that passage uh, and be a little bit more creative and imaginative uh, but, in your in your. I think I could give you a plausible of interpretation of verses 50 to 58 of 1 Corinthians 15 that would make room for the millennium. I think you're absolutizing the death of death there when you don't need to. If, if you're required to let millennium happen, you'd read that text and you say, it's not absolutized, my death is overcome, the decisive blow is struck, but it's loose, it's, it's open to expansion, and death decisively happens there, but if that were all that Paul said about what happens at the second coming, but I believe he also says that that's when the resurrection occurs for both the good and the evil. I believe he also says, as in 2 Thessalonians 1, that it is at that time that and, the lost are cast into eternal destruction, and not the, a thousand and years later. the Old later. Testament prophets make it sound like when the Messiah comes, the new age is going to dawn. The desert's going to bloom, the Spirit's going to be poured out on, from on high. And, and we believe it that did. what's happened... It did. Well, <laughs> we believe right, that and, that death, and death died. We believe that and what's happened died. is Jesus came and some, those blessings reached back and took hold of the present in an already not yet kind of way. So already in many right. ways, but yeah. not yet like it's going to be someday. And so, right. Jim, I would, and, I would and tend to you agree. you can do the same things with what you're talking about. In I want well, to I go to Revelation 20. I don't believe you can, Hallelujah. and I will just simply say this. I believe that um, I believe that Revelation 20 
confirms and supports the Good. interpretation. Good. Well, let's go there. Yes. I we believe there. in the inerrancy of Scripture. Yes. I believe John is consistent with Paul. As we go to Revelation 20, I'd like, to, I'd like to say something about it, and that is that the thousand, you've got a thousand years in Revelation 20 at the, near the climax of the a book, which is crammed full of um, symbols, numbers, uh, you've got um, so let's hundred... interpret the symbols in relationship to each other, right? Okay, and let's yeah, interpret yeah, yeah, the numbers yeah, yeah. and the periods of time in relationship. Don't to each don't other. relativize it too quickly. No. Yeah, no, what, what, and we can't what, just flatten the symbols as no, though they don't mean anything. No, we don't want to. No, here's I'm, the guy. I'm agreeing. I with... want him to walk us through the text, and 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 you you say it is precisely because of the text that you are yes. a amillennialist, and you yes. say it's precisely because of the text yes, that you the, are. So we're here, and we've got a half an hour, roughly. A, and there's a herman, I'd like to just throw this hermeneutical principle. You interpret the clear text, uh, the, the, the unclear text, in the light of the clear text. Okay. Now, we all agree with that in principle. Yes. The in, devil's well, in the details. Yes. So well, I think you know, Revelation's clear. Yes. Right? Amen. But, Revelation 20 is clear. I, so, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding his ha- in his hand the key to the bottomless pit. Revelation chapter, chapter, 20, 20, chapter 20, verse 1. And a great chain. And I just want to observe that there's an angel coming down from heaven here. And, and if you look back at Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, uh, the fifth angel blows his trumpet. I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. He was given the key to the shaft of a bottomless pit. Let's say the angel is symbolic. Let's say the shaft is symbolic. Let's say the key is symbolic. In Revelation 9, they open the bottomless pit and all these demonic beings come rushing out. The opposite of that is about to happen in Revelation 20. Right. Okay? So let's interpret the symbols in relationship to each other. Amen. Um, so this guy in Revelation 20 verse 1 has the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. Note the key and the chain. Verse 2, he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him. Key, chain, seized, bound for a thousand years. Comment on the thousand years. We've got all these periods of time in Revelation. We've got an hour, we've got 10 days, we've got uh, forever and ever, and a thousand years is different from all those symbols, right? An hour is a period of time that the, that the beast is going to have authority in Revelation 7, 17, 12. 10 days is how long one of those churches is going to suffer back in Revelation 2. A thousand years is a different symbol. No. It's, it's a different period of time than those other periods but, of time. No. It, it's not 10 days. No, but you got also got 42 months. You've got right. He's well, just saying it's well, different. I don't know why could, you're saying it. Well, go ahead. I'll say why you're saying my, it. My point is, I, I would argue that those 42 month periods interpret the whole time between uh, the two advents of Christ, and now we've got a different period of time. Well, I agree with you. Yeah, right, we've got right, a different period right. of time, a thousand years, that's describing right. something different than it's that 42 month period. It's just period. different. Yeah, I I it's, it's a, a different. It's number. symbolizing something different, is what I'm saying. Yeah. I think it's symbolizing the same period. Well, we would have to, we'd have to flesh out the details. Okay, keep going. Uh, okay, so he throws him into the pit in verse 3, and he shut it, and he sealed it. And let me just observe. There's a key. There's a chain. He seizes the dragon. He binds him. He throws him in the pit. He shuts the pit, and he seals the pit over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. Now, if this is the same period as the church age, the 42 months... We look back at Revelation chapter 12, where I would argue in Revelation 12, verses 7 through 12, we have a sort of cosmic depiction of Christ's triumph on the cross. And Satan is thrown down to the earth, and he's not bound. Verses 13 through 17, he sees that he has a short period of time, and he goes off to make war on the woman and her seed, which I think is persecution of the church. So so according to your reading, Sam, Satan is both making war on the church and her, the woman and her seed, the church, and he's bound and chained and cannot deceive the nations Absolutely. any longer. Absolutely. And, and, and I, think, I think that is taking two symbols <laughs> that are meant to communicate different ideas and flattening them and making them the same thing. Okay, let me you sound, like, you, that's your you sound like we did sound about 10 minutes yeah. ago. <laughs> let me respond. Okay. okay. First of all, talking about Revelation 12 and Revelation 20. We have two scenes here that are designed to describe manifestations of the victory of Christ through his life, death, and resurrection and exaltation of the right hand of the Father. Revelation 12, we have this this scene of a battle between Michael and his angels and Satan and his. We have this, this idea of Satan is cast down from heaven to earth. 
Well, we don't mean that in a literal spatio geographical sense because certainly you're not going to say that Satan was never on the earth before because Jesus encountered him in the wilderness. Job certainly had encounters with him. So what's the point? What's the, the, end, what's the meaning of the symbols or the, or the imagery? It is that by virtue of what Christ has accomplished, described in the first part of Revelation 12, Satan can no longer accuse the brethren with any degree of success. But that's exactly uh, what second, he does in Revelation 13, second, second, the next chapter. Second. So the point is that by virtue of what Christ has accomplished, the legal strength of his accusations against us are empty. Romans 8, who shall bring anything to the charge of God's elect? God is the one who justifies. How is that portrayed with regard to Satan? It's portrayed as a casting down to the earth. Well, guess what? He's already been here. It's not as if he never was before, and it's not as if he isn't in heaven as well. So he's describing in Revelation 12 that manifestation of the victory of Christ over the enemy. Revelation 20, he's describing another manifestation with different symbolism. Now he's saying, because of the life, death, resurrection, exaltation of Christ, Satan is also restrained with regard to deceiving the nations, lest they uh, provoke, as it were, a premature Armageddon. Because he says in verse 7 that when he gets out of the abyss after the thousand years, what does he do? He goes forth to deceive the nations, to gather them together in a cosmic battle against the people of God. Right. So we have two chapters, both of which are describing the effects of the life, death, resurrection, exaltation of Christ on the powers of darkness. They're using different symbolism, different imagery to describe different aspects of his victory. One, the accuser can no longer bring a successful charge against God's people. Another, the accuser can no longer deceive the nations, prevent the gospel from going to the ends of the earth, or prematurely provoke Armageddon. Okay. They're perfectly can, compatible, can I, can, and I think they both refer to what happened in the first century in I conjunction okay. with the first coming of Christ. I think there are two reasons why you can't read Revelation 12 as though it's describing the same thing as Revelation 20. Number one... Well, oh, not the same thing. I just said they're different manifestations, different expressions. Of the same reality. Of the reality of the effect of the life, death, and resurrection okay. of Jesus on the powers okay. of darkness. And I would argue that the details of the two passages are too different. So that in, at the end of Revelation 12, Satan is making war on the saints. And in chapter 13, he's given authority for 42 months. Now, now how can he have authority for 42 months while he's uh, seized and bound and shut and sealed in the pit? It's very simple. You have to ask the question. Wait, let me give you my second reason why I don't seized think... Seized and bound and shut up with respect to what? Well... To deceiving respect, the nations and provoking with a global assault against exactly the church. exactly what he's doing in Revelation 11 through 13. So the other reason that, that I think your interpretation just utterly fails, with all love to you, um, <laughs> and I appreciate you and, and, and Brother. you know that I love you, um, is, is the literary structure of the book. So I think we have to ask ourselves the question, why does the seventh trumpet come right in the middle of the book and not at the end of the book? And I would argue that the reason is because... So you have Revelation 11, 15 through 19, where the seventh trumpet is blown and the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. On either side of that, in Reve the first part of Revelation 11 and uh, uh, Revelation 12 into the first part of 13, you have Satan making war on the church in those two passages. That's the way I would read those passages. Can I throw something in, in here? Um, if it would be helpful. Yeah. I, if, <laughs> go ahead. I feel that it will be helpful. The, I think this is an illustration of the hermeneutical principle that I wanted to start with. You interpret the unclear passage in the light of the clear one. All right, so Matthew 20, 28, Jesus came and said unto them, All powers given unto me in heaven and on earth, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy, Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Second, you know? Second Corinthians 4, it, this is, 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, and so forth. First Peter 5, God 8, of the, God Satan of this, is prowling around God of this like age. a roaring lion, seeking whom he now may devour. He, he thinks that 
freedom of the devil stopped at 70 AD. Yeah, God of this age. Oh my. So Jesus yeah. said. No, I'd agree that, with you. See, I would agree with you on that, Jim. I, yeah. I, right. And I would think. First, We're shifting first alliances. John five, That's right. Nine. But Jim, but Jim just well, I did, where was he going? I'm, finish, I, finish, finish. So are you saying, Jim, minute, that he, no unbeliever turn. can come to faith in Christ? No. First, yeah, okay, let's get okay, John. I've lost here. control. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here's Matthew 28, what was this the point? The, the point in Matthew is Jesus gives the church our marching orders. What's unclear about it? He says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. It's all mine. Right. Okay? Right. And uh, he says, on that basis, go disciple the nations, baptizing them, teaching them obedience. Mm -hmm. Th this is a clear passage. It's not clear about the implications of how free the devil is. Well, it's clear about what we're told to do. Yeah. All right. Okay. We're told to disciple the nations, baptize them, and teach them obedience right. because Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. And there's, there's no um, symbolic numerology here. Okay. There's, no, there's, there's no dragons or women or, 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 <laughs> or, 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 tr or trumpets or, or rivers of blood or... Uh, and so the point with regard the, to the, the, the The point is that when I read Matthew 28 and I get the church's marching orders, this is a clear passage. We're told what to do. Yeah. We're told to evangelize the world. Right. We're told to disciple the nations. The, and Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth, that's the basis for it. Now, in Revel and this drives how we are to read Revelation. So when we get to Revelation and, and we're told uh, that the time is short, the time is near, this is all, this is coming at you like a freight train. It's almost on top of us. And then in the very beginning of the book, he says, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father, to him be glory and dominion forever, in 1, 6. And then in 5, it says, uh, in chapter 5, it says, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Okay, this is not a heavenly reign. This is, we shall reign on the earth. Now, when I go through the book of Revelation, one of the things I try to do, and this is sort of just like a, a principled ambiguity earlier, a principled, not agnosticism, I, I, but I want to read through the book of Revelation sitting loose to the details mm -hmm. because I, I, um, if I could quote Chesterton, he said that, um, uh, that St. John the Divine saw many strange monsters in his vision, but none so strange as any one of his own commentators. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think that we need to do is say, look, I think the consensus of the Christian church through 2,000 years is that the book of Revelation is not as clear as the book of Romans. The book of Revelation is not as clear as the book of Galatians. We have, so what do we hold? It, what, what should be the governing principle, the governing text? I think our marching orders to evangelize the world, to preach the gospel to every creature, to exercise this sort of spiritual authority through the gospel and through the gospel only should come should bring us to the point where we say, okay, now I come to the book of Revelation. I come to the twentieth, the twentieth chapter. I have, a, it, I agree with you that you've got uh, time indicators: half an hour in heaven, and you know, forty-two months, and that sort of thing. But you have a thousand, you have one hundred and forty-four, you have twelve hundred stadia as the lengths of the sides of the New Jerusalem, which is a perfect cube. All of these indicate that. I'm dealing with apocalyptic literature that was a genre that was... And it sounds like you don't want to try to interpret it. No, I'm, I want to try to interpret it, but I want to do it in a post-millennial setting where we have lots of time. <laughs> We've been working on it for 2,000 years. Yeah. And, the only thing, and I, I believe that we will need lots of time in order to work through uh, in order to work through it. I do believe that it was a revelation, not a hiding. You know, it's an unveiling. It's, a, um, it's meant to bless us and reveal certain things to us. But I, Can I we think go back we have to Revelation 20. I yeah, think we have we to go to Revelation 20, knowing that that is going to be a harder nut for us to crack yeah. than some so of the things. So let's let him keep cracking for a few All more right. minutes. All okay. right. So, so in verses one through three of Revelation 20, it looks to me like Satan's activity is totally shut down. No. No longer no. is the this world, First John 5, 19, under the power of the evil one. Now the evil one is in the pit and the pit is shut and it's sealed. And then verse four, I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. They were physically killed. Right. 
and for the word of God and who had not worshipped the beast. That's what everybody was tempted to do back in Revelation 13, 5. Uh, the beast has this head. He's got seven heads, and one of the heads has a mortal wound, and, one of, and it came back to life. And I think the point is the beast has faked something like the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. So the beast has done something that looks like what God has done, and, all these, and the whole world worships it except for Revelation 13, 8, those whose names are written in the book of life. Uh, and so forth. Who do you believe the beheaded are? The beheaded are those who didn't worship the beast or its image in verse where, 4 where, here. But where do you and, place them in history? I, mean, uh, all, I would say all uh, faithful believers throughout church history. Okay, even though the beast is not throughout all ch church history? No, I, no, the beast has authority for 42 months. And, and before that, the first, uh, well, depending on how you interpret those 42 months, I would suggest that either those 42 months are the second half of Daniel's 70th week, or maybe uh, the whole of Christian church history. I, but I agree with that. Okay, I mean, right. By the way, Revelation tells us exactly who the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus for the word of God are. Earlier in chapter 6, I looked under the altar to the, right. and saw the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. Precisely the same Greek language is used. And he's talking about those in the and, intermediate but, state. No, 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 no. Yes, he is. But Sam, Revelation look, 6 look, is talking okay. about those in the intermediate state. But look state. what happens to them after the intermediate state at the end of verse 4. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So first, the beast, Revelation 13, 5, has authority for 42 months. Revelation 13, 8, he kills, he makes war on the church and beheads these people. And then after the intermediate state, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And then verse... Five, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. There's two resurrections, one on each side of the thousand years. And then at the end of verse five there, this is the first resurrection. N.T. Wright, uh, whom ah. you love, <laughs> and uh, N.T. Wright looks at all of the, the uses of uh, anastasis and related terms all through Greek letter, literature leading up to Revelation 20. And he says that for this to mean something other than bodily Life after life after death, your intermediate state, would be a radical innovation. Innovation, in, it, and he says it would stretch the usage beyond the breaking point. I've got the page number in Resurrection of the Son of God. If you want me to give it to you, I am going to have a chance to and, respond to this. And and then he says, lest we be projected into premillennial literalism, which I think he's just saying, I don't want to be a premillennialist. Mm -hmm. What we have here is essentially a radical innovation in the use of resurrection language. But and I think back, he's doing up violence to, But let's to back the up text. to verse, we have to back up to verse 4. If I could come galloping in with some literalism here. Um, <laughs> that's my job as a post-millennialist. Um, the, the beast, these people who are beheaded in verse 4 are beheaded by the beast. The, the beast is a seven-headed um, uh, beast the seven heads are seven hills. All right, the seven heads are also yep. seven kings. Yep. Five, so, yep. five were. Yep. All right, so this, the beast, that, the head of the beast that's reigning that this is talking about is Nero. Right. You well, start with Julius, Augustus. Yes, you, I you, would argue that and, this is a typological use of the world power at the time and that, that it's going to be that way. That pattern is going to follow all through church history. Now, I, I agree that the pattern follows all through church history, but it happens that Nero persecuted the church from AD 64 to AD 68. But your view For, demands he, that this book be written before AD 70, well, which well, is a very difficult case to make in view well, of the, the external evidence. It's easier than you think, but the point is this. Well, if you want to believe that, it's easy. <laughs> but we don't have time for it. Yeah. Now, the, the, point, the point is that Nero, who occupied the, the right place on the number of heads of the beast, persecuted the saints of God for 42 months. And, and this From was a, 64 and to this, 68 was 42 months. He persecuted the church for 42 months. The beheaded in this, uh, on your system, you're having to press the, the literal 1,000 years, but you're not pressing the beast or the ones beheaded I'm by the beast. I'm not pressing anything. I'm saying that, that uh, the beast's opposition to believers and his beheading of them is typical of the way the, the wicked world powers um, persecute the church. Whether they behead us or not, let's continue. Yeah. Yeah. So, wait, wait, so, so let, let me finish, and then you, 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 can, you, can, you can respond to all the arguments. Just get the whole yeah. paragraph in yeah. front of you. Okay, so you've got, a, you've, got a, you've got these people who are physically killed, 
And then when Christ comes, they're brought to physical life. That's what the, res- the first resurrection refers to. Physical life after life after death. After the intermediate state. They reign with Christ for a thousand years. That's the first resurrection. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ. And they will reign with him for a thousand years. And then verse 7. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. And then he comes out. He deceives the nations. Uh, They make war on Christ. Christ puts down the rebellion. Then the great white throne is set up. So I think you have a sequence here of a resurrection, thousand years of bliss reigning with Christ on earth, and then at the end of the thousand years, Satan is let out of that that pit, and he's loosed from those chains. And and so, like what we saw in Revelation 9-1 happens again. Somebody opens the the, uh, shaft of the bottomless pit, lets him go. And then he he does this work, there's a final rebellion, it's ended, and then the great white throne is set up, and then after the judgment, we enter into the new heavens and the new earth in Revelation 21 and 22. And now let me explain why I think that's wrong. My understanding, you you use the word with respect to Satan's incarceration in the abyss, totally. You're universalizing what John explicitly restricts. He says that with regard to Satan's capacity during the thousand years to deceive the nations, he is totally restrained. And I agree with that. But with regard to all of his other activities. Revelation 13, 7. It was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. But you don't believe that. In the 42 months, Satan has authority over the nations. Let me finish. You don't believe that means that Satan can prevent the gospel from going to the nations and bringing conversions. Right, but I believe that then Revelation 21 through 3 is describing something different but than the gospel going to the nations. Well, then we'd have to go back into Acts 26. We'd go back into Colossians 2. We could go back into other texts. But, but in the Jim, in let the me terms finish. Of this book, let me finish, please. Let me finish. Thank you. <laughs> order, order. In the courtroom. That's precisely what... what Jesus told what Paul testified when he said that Christ has commissioned me to turn the nations from the darkness of Satan to the light of God's kingdom. During the time of this present inner advent age, Satan cannot prevent the gospel from succeeding in bringing souls globally to faith in Christ. He can persecute the church. He can blind the minds of, of unbelievers who are recalcitrant in their rejection of Christ in the non-elect. He can attempt uh, He can swallow up if we give him ground, but when it comes to deceiving the nations with regard to the gospel and to orchestrating this global cosmic resistance to the church of Christ, he is prevented thoroughly and totally. Now, let me finish. I get, because you had all the other statements you made. Let me finish. I agree with that. Okay. Secondly, it says, he said, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. As I said in Revelation 6, those are identified as those in the intermediate state. It's also interesting that in Revelation 2.11, Jesus says to the church at Smyrna, be faithful unto death. He's talking about their martyrdom under the authority of the beast. And I will give you the crown of life. You're going to die physically. You're going to come to life. And the second death will have no power over you. Precisely what we are told here. They are martyred physically. They come to life in the, in the intermediate state. And the second death has no authority over them. Now, one more thing real quickly. You said you appeal to anastasis and the concept of resurrection. And you said everywhere it refers to physical bodily resurrection. I agree with you. I'll go on record saying that's the single strongest argument for premillennialism, but it's not persuasive for this reason. You're making a case that um, we have to take the word anastasis in the way it is used consistently outside the book of Revelation. By the way, this is the only place it's used in Revelation. Only here. Nowhere else. Why do you premillennialists conveniently ignore the word thrones, which is used 47 times in Revelation, 40 of which are relevant Sometimes it refers to the throne of Satan or the throne of the beast. Every single time without exception, thrones are heavenly. They are never on the earth. That's also the case with every single use of thrones outside the book of Revelation. Then, finally, on the issue of the first resurrection. I admit, I I concede to you, Jim, obviously. I mean, it's easy to prove. N.T. Wright was correct. Anastasis used, is, refers to physical resurrection outside the book of Revelation. This is its only occurrence inside the book of Revelation. But notice, if you would, this is the only place in the entire New Testament where it's called the first 
resurrection. And, it's contra- and we have here in Revelation 20 and 21, we have descriptions of what is first and old pertaining to the present transient order of things. And then we also have reference, especially when we come to chapter 21, to that which is second and new, which is a reference to the eternal, permanent, consummate state of things. So I think it's clear as you read the sequentially through this, chap- this passage, he's not describing a resurrection that is then followed by the same kind of resurrection, a first and a second. He's contrasting the resurrections in the same way that he contrasts the first with the new and the old with that which is second. And so the point is, there is a first resurrection that is a coming to life in the intermediate state. It's called first, the only place where it is, indicating we're dealing with something very unique here. The millennial reign transpires throughout the whole course of this present age. The saints are reigning with Christ in the intermediate state. He identifies them who they are. At the second coming of Christ, the rest of the dead are raised. That's a physical resurrection of unbelievers at which time they are judged and cast into the lake of fire, as Matthew indicates, as Revelation indicates as well. Can I reply? Sure. Okay. Your view demands what's happening in Revelation 13, 5 through 8 is precisely that the beast is deceiving the nations. And verse 7 of Revelation 13 says that authority was given to the beast over every tribe and people and language and nation. So your do, view demands... Deceiving with regard to what? Define that. They're worshiping... The beast. They're, they're worshiping so because no, of this so fake nobody's crucifixion coming to and faith in Christ in the present age. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying well, that... Well, then... The, I, no. Okay. I'm saying that uh, what Revelation 21 through 3 says isn't happening is happening in Revelation 13, 5 through 7. He is deceiving the nations. That, that's, that's one thing I want to say. And then I want to respond to something that Doug, Doug said earlier and that you kind of hinted at or are hinting at when you talk about this one passage... And, and this one reference to the thousand years. And I just want to ask some questions. So, how many texts in the Old Testament explicitly name the new covenant? There's one, Jeremiah 31. It's the only place where that phrase is used, I think. How many texts in the Old Testament explicitly refer to the future royal uh, ruler as a Messiah? There's one that's undisputed, Daniel 9, 25. How many texts in the Old Testament say that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of of the serpent. There's one, Genesis 3.15. And, and I think I would want to ask Doug, how many texts in the whole Bible say we should baptize babies? <laughs> um, and, and well, give them communion. <laughs> don't, go, don't respond to that. Yeah. So, Does so, everyone see my restraint? So I don't, I don't think yes, that do. the fact that this one passage is, is problematic for us. Oh, I don't have it. I, have, I agree totally with everything you just said. The fact that this is one passage that talks about them, I'm happy with it. I think it's talking about the intermediate state, so I have no problem in saying there's one passage that's describing a thousand years. Jim? I, I believe that. But one, one, real quickly here, one more thing. I, I do have a question as well. You say that here in uh, beginning in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, at the second coming of Christ, after Christ has returned, the devil um, can no longer deceive the nations, and he's in the abyss, so that won't happen. I just want to know where the heck these nations came from. Because according to your reading of Revelation 19, the flesh of kings, captains, mighty men, horses, riders, flesh of all men, both free and slaves, small and great, are consumed, and they are thrown, uh, the, the beast of false prophet are thrown in the lake of fire, and the rest, the rest of who? The rest of the nations who were gathered in this battle were slain by the sword. The nations that you say Satan is now having to be incarcerated so that he can't deceive, have all been killed at the time of the second coming of Christ. There are no nations left that he can deceive. And I would say evidently it's not comprehensive. And, and I would also observe... <laughs> Why not just take the, the would, plain literal meaning I would, I would and say... I would also observe that at the end of Revelation 19, the beast and the false prophet, thanks for reminding me of this, are thrown into the right. lake of fire. That's in verse 20 of Revelation 19. And then down in Revelation chapter 20 verse 10... The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were already. And so it seems like there's one defeat, and then there's this inter- intervening period, and then there's a defeat of the dragon, and he's thrown in yeah. where the beast and, and false prophet are. Let me explain why that are. can't be the case. Because what we have in Re- race between Revelation 19 and 20 are parallel accounts of the same span of time, namely the church age or the millennial kingdom. 
And the fact of the matter is, you'll notice in, there in Revelation 20.10, the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where literally, this is what it says, and literally, where also the beast and the false prophet, nothing. And it makes far better sense to supply not where the beast and the false prophet are, but where the beast and the false prophet were thrown, directly taken from Revelation chapter 19, uh, verse 20. You're so making the, my case. No, the point is, Revelation 19 describes the, the end of human history, what's called the Battle of Armageddon, the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 20 recapitulates to describe the whole present age again, the consummation of which is Satan is now thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet also were thrown. And I think that takes different symbols and flattens them out so that they it all have flatten the same them out. It's recapitulate. It's parallelism. And the ellipsis here that does not supply a verb is far better supplied from 1920 than it is just saying where they are. Like one of the tag one other thing on this, and this is from within the text that you went through. When you're done, I'm going to do some summing. All right. Okay. Um, in, in Revelation 20, I believe, Jim, you're, the difficulty that I have with what you're saying is that you have a very specific binding of Satan, a very specific thousand years. Within, John has that. But if, uh, <laughs> so, John, yes. John's got some other stuff coming up, too. Um, <laughs> A very specific Satan, a very specific thousand years. It's a historical period. The historicity of it is being affirmed at a very specific point in time. But then, in order to populate this very specific millennium, you appeal to a gen generic martyrs, martyred by a generic beast throughout well, all... Well, we read about it in Revelation 13. The, well, the, the, the beast that we have in Revelation, this goes back to what I said at the beginning of the book. These things are soon to happen. It's right on top of you. It's at the door. Um, Daniel is told. Um, Daniel is told, for example, to seal up the words of the prophecy because the time is not yet. And the events were um, uh, the events were four hundred years. Okay, so if these out. are the people martyred under Nero, the, well, the point is that in Revelation, in Revelation, he's told, "Don't seal the words because the, it's right on top of us. Don't seal the words because it's right on top of us." And yet, here we are 2,000 years out. Daniel is told to seal the words of the prophecy because it's, it's a while yet. And, that's just, and the fulfillment of that was 400 years later. I take the, the book of Revelation as right on top of the first century church. It, it's at hand. It's near. It's now. And the, it, was, it was immediate. Nero, the beast, the persecuting beast, all of this was alive. Um, at, for the recipients of the letter. So when John says, here, the number of the beast is this, and he says, this is for the guy who has wisdom. John knows who it is, right? John knows who, who it is, and he expects some sharp sophomore in college to be up late that night figuring it out. Okay, okay let him who has wisdom figure this out. John knows who it is. He f expects some of his first century readers to figure it out. And I can't imagine Demetrius in Ephesus figuring it out saying, who the heck is Henry Kissinger? <laughs> right? Nobody's arguing that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, can, I can see someone in the first century saying, Nero, this, the number of the beast is 666, Nero, beast, persecuting. I believe that the beast and the martyrs are very specific in history. And you've got a very specific millennium at the end of history, but you have to make the martyrs and the beheading and the process that populates the saints for that generic. And I think that you should do one thing or the other through the text. And, and I would disagree with what you're saying I'm doing. But I, I, and I just want I'm to make one more comment, and, I just, and I'm going to leave it there, and I love Jim too. But when I read Revelation 19, and, and, and the birds of the, of the heavens are said, come gather for the great supper of God. This is 19, verse 18. To eat the flesh of kings, flesh of captains, flesh of mighty men, flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And then it says the beast and the false prophet are, are killed, um, and, and who had done the signs, signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. You'd think, wow. That's just about everybody, isn't it? And if that's not enough, verse 21, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, Jesus, at his second coming. 
So I'm saying if you can extract out of that kind of rather extensive, exhaustive slaughter of all unbelievers at the second coming of Christ, this remnant who survived to enter into the millennium because you got to have them to propagate, to constitute the nations, and so on. I, I, I don't have any, I have nothing more to say. I don't know what I could say to that. I, I, don't know how, I, don't know how you, I don't know how you have Satan deceiving nations that all just got slaughtered. They, they don't exist. They're killed by the second coming of Christ. And you can't conceive of any way unbelievers could... You read Revelation 19. If you can conceive of it, you convince me, and then I'll repent. What about babies? We baptized them. <laughs> I, think, I think, Sam, we could, we could just say the, the rest of those who were present at that moment, the rest who were there when there, this happened. On the globe, on the earth, who were... That's the way you're reading it. But well, you yeah, that's the way it, I'm reading it. So I just say, it and, we and, put you, and, and I would together. say, Jim, I agree. If you can read it differently... And in good conscience say that there are, therefore, nations left over of unbelievers in natural, unglorified bodies that enter this purported millennial kingdom. Right. Then I just say, God bless you and we'll disagree. So you, you disagree. said that the biggest problem for amillennialism is the meaning of anastasis in verse 6, is it? Yeah, it's consistent. And, and, he, and, I, and would I you say that. that getting natural bodies and unbelievers into the millennium is the biggest problem for premillennialism? Probably so, yes. What's the biggest problem for postmillennialism? Baptizing babies. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I would say I alluded to the biggest. I think the biggest problem for postmillennialists is grabbing too soon, is triumph. Uh, an, no, I don't mean the problem if you believe it, what to do with it. I mean whether textual. it's true or not. D textual. Um, textual the, 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 actually, the biggest problem I have is, um, is in harmonizing First and Second Thessalonians. Um, th that would we be the, go there, but so yeah. First Thessalonians four thirteen. You take to be the second coming of yes, correct. And, and but but I also take the man of the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, yeah. as a yeah. Roman uh, yeah. as the Roman emperor. Right. And I and I, do I and I don't I don't have a way of. Right. And he's already arisen, and the rebellion has already happened. Well, like I said, there's a problem. That's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, actually, it's not. But okay, <laughs> okay, right. we'll stop. That's for another night. <laughs> I think it would be helpful to take a few minutes, even though our time is up, and, and go back where we started and ask about the practical implications of these three views. You, you were all very animated, more than I expected you to be. I, I thought this was, uh, uh, I didn't think you expect to feel as strongly but, as you do. So um, <laughs> that's energizing to me. I love it. That's why I like you guys a lot, because you care about the Bible and care about truth, even, even this one. So now, here's, here's the issue. You said, let's start here and then take maybe five minutes on this. Our marching orders from Matthew 28, 19 20. He has all authority in heaven and on earth right now. Whatever Satan, whatever freedom he has, he has Jesus has all authority. He says, go make disciples of all the nations. Um, how do your views, just say something positive about why we can work together with these views and why the other view, if you think this, doesn't undermine doing what we're called to do. My, uh, give you my first, when I read post-millennialism, I fret over, over the first problem you said, namely that it will become um, dominion, theonomy, uh, take over with carnal means. Right. You refresh me by insisting it will be spiritual means, it will be worship and right. the right worshiping of God. And when I read your strategies for conquering the world, they feel just like mine. Right. Even though I don't expect the world to be conquered in the same way you do. So that my pattern of life and ministry uh, doesn't pick up the sword and you're not picking up the sword. It's unclear to me, like we talked on the panel, about when the Christian Congress might pick up the sword, but that's not where you are, right. and you don't want to think that way, it sounds to me. Right. So that would be one example of what I'm fishing for, is that I hear his strategies in um, the triumphant spread of the gospel being exercised in ways very much like the way I live my life. 
What more like that can we say? How, how did pre I'll, and ah? Uh, I want to make what you said more explicit, okay. that, I, that it's very comforting that you say we conquer the same way Jesus did in a death and resurrection kind of conquering. Right. So I appreciate that very much. And uh, you and I have agreed a lot tonight, and, and, um, and we, I think we've agreed on a lot of interpretive matters. And, um, and, and I think that we would both say that um, the gospel is going to advance and God is going to prosper the preaching of the gospel. I think we would all say that. Mm -hmm. And so I think we can all affirm those things. Yeah, I, I think in terms of, it, and I'm not trying to align up against Doug here, but it's just, just in terms of That's okay. how it affects um, our expectations for the future and how the church lives out its life, that Jim and I would probably be in more agreement we're going to as suffer over, until the end. Yeah, that suffering, I think suffering is actually going to increase, intensify, and spread. And I think the way the church conquers is Revelation 12. 11. They con uh, yeah, 12, 11. They conquered Satan, the enemy, the beast, by the word of their testimony, the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, by not loving their lives to death. They died physically, and by dying physically under the oppressive power of Satan, the beast, they win. That's the victory yep. that is secured by the church in this age. And I think Jim and I would agree that there is going to be this increase of, of uh, oppression and persecution of the church um, that uh, is not going to abate until yep. the second coming of Jesus. Yep. And I think Doug would say he believes he has confidence that through the power of the Holy Spirit, the spread of the gospel, there will be a slow and progressive but yet decisive and at some point visible manifestation of a more right. Right. widespread victory that can be more cultural, right. governmental, political, right. economic in nature. Right. I would say I don't see that in Scripture. He does, and I know the verses he uses in the Old Testament, primarily in the Psalms. Right. They're tough right. to answer. He's, he's, he, he's got a good point. Yeah. I wish Not we if got, you've got a millennium. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I wish that he had had time to, to yeah. defend yeah. those yeah. texts. Yeah. And Tomorrow and in the coming year, we will all be, we four, will all be preaching the gospel in public, sending missionaries to the nations, saying, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and meaning a, a little bit different. Same thing at the center, and then broaden it out differently. And we will be willing to lay down our lives that people might see the supreme glory of Jesus Christ. The only way they can come to know him is, I mean, come to be saved is by believing in him. The nations need to hear the gospel. All that's true. Is that correct? Amen. Yes. Give a closing minute exhortation to the watchers of this about where to go from here. Because some people are going to say, I just give up. I just give up. These guys are so smart and they've got doctorates and they're, they cannot agree on the interpretation of the first six verses of Revelation 20. So say something by way of guidance to the frustrated layman right now who would like to have some sense of what's coming at him and he doesn't feel like he's nearly as competent as you guys are. You guys are. Just a minute or two each as we close about something encouraging and helpful for the watchers. You have exalted above all things, O oh Lord, your name and your word. So I would say just keep reading the Bible worshipfully. Keep uh, asking the Lord to give you insight into the texts. And if there seems to be a meaning that is natural and it seems to fit the terms of the book, believe it. So just keep reading the Bible for yourself. And, and if, you've got, if you've got the Bible, you have an Archimedean point on which to stand and a lever and a place to lodge that thing. And you can move scholarly opinions in your own ability to arbitrate them if you've got your arms around texts. I would say keep the gospel central. Always keep the gospel central, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, our imitation of him, and following that uh, as we interpret scripture, as we lay down our lives for others, as we preach the gospel, keep the gospel always and everywhere central. And know that uh, this, all of this, the, these disagreements, the fact that the church for 2,000 years has, has only come to one central eschatological agreement, and that's Jesus Christ will come again to judge the quick and the dead. That's, that's as far as the church has gotten, the, 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 the church broadly has gotten that far. And when we look at the world and how the gospel is progressing through the world, and I look at South America and Africa being overrun by premillennialists, 
I think it's the coolest thing in the world. That's, that's just the kind of thing that God would do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> have people believe the Bible. Have Hallelujah. People, well, yeah, so if, if we say, look, what, what's happened, the church, I think, is well established, far, far more deeply rooted and established in the world today than it was 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago. And the vast majority of the sacrifices and the, um, the, the missionary efforts and the martyrdoms, the vast majority of people who did that, did it uh, through love of the same Jesus, but with a different eschatology than mine. And so, you know, good, good grief. Keep, keep a sense of proportion. Keep the, um, keep the gospel central and keep a sense of proportion and let every man be fully convinced in his own yeah. mind. Yeah. Well, certainly I'd echo both of those. I I don't think I can add anything to them. Um, I would simply say to people who are watching this who probably, uh, some of them are tempted to say, as you said, John, goodness, I'll never understand that. And and if that's what studying the Bible does, uh, I'm just, I'm going to avoid it. And I would say, please don't do that. Um, What we did tonight. You might not turn out like us. (laughs) No, what, what we did tonight was really good. This is healthy. I May, now, I'm, really, I'm, I'm, I'm a sick sort of guy. I love this. You know, yeah. I, I know, some, obvious, people, I know some other people out here were very nervous, and they, they were sitting on edge, <laughs> they and they think Jim and I don't love each other. And um, I, I love this because he's refining my thinking. Doug's refining my thinking. I might go back and look again, and I hope I've given them some thoughts as well. I, and I think, I think God is honored when we take this book seriously yes. enough to do this, yes. that we care about truth. We believe that there is objective, real truth here about what God is doing in history. And he says, wow, those, those, they, they care enough about my word. They believe it is inerrant and infallible enough yeah. that, they're, that they're willing yeah. to go toe-to-toe with each other in the love right. of Christ to try to arrive at some understanding. If in the final analysis, Jim's right, that won't affect my relationship with Jesus one bit, and I won't be disappointed. I'll be saddened that I misled people through my teaching gift. Mm-hmm. If Doug turns out to be right and I'm wrong, I won't be disappointed. I, I kind of hope he's right, by the way, just, you know, between us. <laughs> me, me too. <laughs> uh, um, if he turns out to be right, again, my regret will be that I would have used the gift God has given me to mislead people, which is a, a weighty thing, James 3. We all have to take yeah. into consideration. Yeah. Right. But in order to become a better teacher, I need these guys. I need all of you. I need the whole body of Christ to, to, to call me back to the text, force me to look at things in a new way. So I think that's what I take away from it. I think that we will uh, not ask you what should people read, but maybe get that information, and when this goes onto the web, we'll put it up. Hmm. Some, some readings in pre, post, Uh, for people who want to follow on. Thank you you. all so much for your willingness to do this. Thank you for taking the risk of hosting Um, this. Let's pray and 